Simplicity is probably our biggest peacemaking tool, and we don't realize it. The haves and the have-nots is a big war, at least in a lot of places it has already started, and I see it as, as getting bigger and bigger as the years progress. The haves and the, and the have-nots, the ones who are fed and the ones who are not. The ones who have shelter and the ones who are not. The ones who are warm and the ones who are cold. Um, God has some strong things to say about the highs and the lows in life. Uh, we're all God's children and it doesn't seem right that some should live so much better than others. I teach a course on images of Christ in different parts of the world. So we were discussing image of Christ as a liberator. A liberator from oppression, liberator from want, from poverty. Immediately this question came, what shall I do? All the students felt that they were rich. I think they really came to a realization in a powerful manner that they were rich. So what shall the rich do? So these are questions they are struggling with. I told them that uh, there are three things they could do. One is symbolic acts of working towards justice. They are not real acts that lead to justice, but symbolic. Giving up one meal, having a prayer vigil, these are all symbolic acts. Then there are small steps of the contributions you make, the sharing you do. That's the second level. There is a third level of what I would call systemic acts, structural acts, much more socio-political level of action which they can engage in as they go along to change the things that we find in our society. With regard to systemic change, it is very difficult to give answers right away because it involves a lot more conversation and cooperation between peoples. So in a sense, what I'm teaching my students is once they recognize that there is a need for systemic change, they have to find ways in which they can engage in conversation with people both within the church and outside the church so that together we can work for change change in laws perhaps, change in ways we relate to each other as nations, as communities. But these are uh, acts which one cannot simply do by thinking, okay, let's do it. No, we need to engage in conversation. There's a lot of negotiation to be done, a lot of uh, commitment to cooperate with each other. Well, for many, many years, I didn't know how to go about helping other people. I, I was disturbed by the disparity between people that have money and the ones that don't, the rich and the, the, rich and the poor, the black and the white, the dis differences in, uh, in resources. So after many years, I read an article in 1983 by um, Tony Campalo who said that if we are to uh, follow Christ, then we must learn to sacrifice, to give, to share. And Christ himself set that great example. He had so little. In fact, he was homeless but he shared what he had with others and taught others to do the same. What I have been doing in the last six years is to help people move from the paralysis of guilt. So I tell my students in my first class, it is very easy for me as a person from outside the United States, take just five minutes and paralyze you all with guilt. I can give you horror stories, that is enough but that doesn't help. The one way to do that is that the kind of sin we are talking about, the kind of problem we are talking about, is not an individual problem. It is a problem which is linked to the whole community and the way we are organized in the world. The way we are organized in the world, socially, politically, economically, that's what determines this kind of unfair sharing of resources. So that means we cannot simply be changing individuals. We need to work together so that we can change the way we are organized in the world. But for that kind of activity, we need individuals who feel forgiven of their participation. So in that sense, I am really offering, as a person from outside the US, a certain assurance of forgiveness to people so that that will remove them from the guilt but move them towards doing something. Not simply giving up one meal, but working towards 
structural organizational change. I think people can never act if they are burdened by guilt. So to act, they need forgiveness. There's a bigger issue here than just choosing to live a life so we feel better or we have less and have less to care for. That's still kind of a me message. And the, the real issue is, is that we choose to live that way so we can free up some resources that we didn't have available before. Some of those resources are time, but some of those resources are money. And it's, it, it enables us to live more like the rest of the world lives. In many ways, talking about simple life is a middle class luxury. Most of the world lives simply because they have no other choice. Um, for some of us to say we want to simplify a little bit, that's a middle class luxury. There's also a violence in saying to poor people, you really don't want this. I mean, we've had it, but it's really no good. Uh, you, you try that in a poor neighborhood and you'll get a reaction, oh sure, great, now that you've had it and you're tired of it, we shouldn't want it. And there is every reason that they will want it, that poor people do want some of the stuff we've had. That doesn't take away from the reality that too much is still a curse and that what we're talking about is a kind of sufficiency for everybody not having everybody come up to the level of living that we're doing. The world cannot live the way we're living. The world is getting smaller and we need to learn how to get along better <laughs> and living more um, in sync with one another is a good place to start. There are some benefits to buying at the uh, discount place places because you're, but you can buy a, a hundred pounds of rice and you can buy enormous quantities of things which is in, in one sense better stewardship of your money. You can, you can buy more with what you have. On the other hand there's the struggle of the small business person especially in the small towns and, and sometimes simplicity for us means that we allow people to afford something themselves as well. And so we, we struggle between supporting the local business and, and being able to do financially uh, a, a responsible job. It's a struggle still for us. To live a simpler life ourselves, we need to be careful not to steal simplicity from other people. That means recycling, it means pre-cycling, making good decisions in the first place so you don't also have to recycle later. And that way you live a life that's not only simpler for yourself, but it makes it possible for future generations to have that as well. I think people who volunteer feel a sense of ownership in their community and they get involved and they feel like they can affect some positive change. Um, it's easy to sit back and to say, oh, why bother? Nothing ever changes. And I don't think that's true. I think people, when they come together and they work for a common good, um, unfortunately, in most nonprofits or in the community, we're trying to provide more and more service with less and less dollars. And if we don't start pulling together with people, um, that's the only way we're going to affect a change. We're obligated to share our excesses. If we have extra income that we don't, that, aren't, that isn't vital to our basic needs, then I feel as a Christian that we are obligated to share what we have with others. That's, that's in some ways a radical thought because the average Christian probably gives about two to three percent of their income. But we feel that we are called on to make much greater sacrifice and not to spend too much money on ourselves. So we feel a, a deep obligation and a privilege to be able to help other people who have so little. You know, no place to stay, no food to eat, no way to get from one place to the other, uh, no income, sometimes mentally ill, and they have nobody to sometimes to fall back on. So we feel an obligation to share what we have with others when as Al best we can. When Alan retired in 88, we decided as a family to go to Africa to learn about hunger firsthand and to see if an American family could make a difference. We didn't go with any special program to push forward, mainly to learn. And while we were there, my mother died. And my mother had been mentally ill for many, many years. And looking at the village and looking at the babies' lives that uh, died from simple diseases like diarrhea and malaria, when my mother died, we decided to go ahead and give her estate a total of $30,000 to the women of the village if they could come up with a program that would save the lives of their children. So somewhere in this, this village in a country called Burkina Faso, a country most people never heard of, is this nutritional center built in honor of my mother that actually saves lives of the children. One of the things that we promised these people 
when we came back to the United States that we would do, these people very poor, very hardworking and very honest, is that we would tell their story with justice in all that we do. And it transformed us and ever since then, what we decided to do is to volunteer full time working with the poor here, working with the homeless. And not because it's just the right thing to do, but I think we reach highest when we stoop lowest to help somebody out. That we are inspired and nurtured and meet Jesus in those that have so little. Why? Because they're closer to God than maybe a lot of us are because we have things that get in the way where they don't. They have their faith and their strength and they take each day as it's the beginning of a, a new day and the, and the last day of their life and that's how they live it. So it's a lot to be inspired by and learn from working with the poorest of the poor. I think that what we're all striving for is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God comes from within, not through consumerism. Once we discover the kingdom of God within us, then God helps us discover our neighbor. And once we discover our neighbor, we're able to go out and love and serve our neighbor. And that's what life's all about.